Welcome, welcome to Frame Rate, where we rate frames. He's Abe Epperson. I'm Michael Hi. Swain. There's also a guest. We're so glad they came. Thanks to our sponsor, Bender Bending Rodriguez. <laughs> Sorry. I think he should have made his name something that rhymed. That's on him. <laughs> yep, yeah, let's pick the flick. You can do it too. Go to the patreon.com slash small beans and you can, uh, if it's open, click that shit. And you can uh, ask us to cover a specific movie that you want us to cover within reason. Within reason. And the entirely reasonable movie that Bender Bending Rodriguez wanted us to cover is 1997's The Game. It was actually, there was a choice between some, but uh, we put it to our guest, David Bell. Which which would you rather watch? And I believe he just responded, Game! 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 So... Very that efficient us, intro, by the it way. It gives Sorry. us a little. Oh, thank you. Gives us mm. a little hint into what the response to this question would be. But we usually kick things off by asking the guest, "Hey, Dave, what's your experience with the game? Had you watched oh. this a lot? Do you like the game? What's your deal?" He I loves the game. I, I love the game. I love the game. <laughs> I bet. Um, I think I saw the game <laughs> when it came out. I might not have seen it in theaters. So I I I remember. <laughs> Um, Fincher kind of, you know, showing up in my life in my teens when I was a supple young teen, um, and just like banging them all out on VHS. Um, this is, I believe, his third film, and just yeah, it's right after Seven. Yeah, it it went Alien Three, Seven, and then this, and then Fight Club, and it's like Jesus Christ, man, Jeez. what a lineup! Wait, Alien Three was his first directorial credit. Yes, um, he weird. did a lot of music videos and stuff. Yeah, sure. He was. I think they put him on that. He kind of got pushed around in Alien Three. Like, I I think he doesn't really like how that came out. I think it's fine, but that's a different podcast. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, this I, I've wa I I can't remember. I, I like I said, I didn't see it in theaters, but I'm pretty sure I saw it, it at least a year after when it, was it came fresh, out. Sure. Yeah. yeah, I think I saw it on DVD. And this was made during a time, and like we're going to spoil the shit out of this movie, obviously. This was made during a time where like we weren't used to plot twists. It, does that make sense? Like we were a little more naive about tw plot twists. That isn't to say yes. a little bit. There Stuff any. existed, like Dark City existed, but right. it stood out for that reason. But then, you, yeah, you look at this lineup again. Seven, the game, Fight Club. It was like Fincher was like introducing us to fight uh, for to plot to twist. plot twist would, major. Would plot you guys twist. say that like the heyday of the plot twist was really started by the Shyamalan and Sixth Sense? I wouldn't that call was it ninety nine. Right? See, I wouldn't call that the heyday. I would actually call that when things started going wrong, because I think well, right. the, the problem with yeah plot twist the abuse started. <laughs> the abuse the started turning twists into a mystery box was a whole thing happening there. That was the evolution was occurring. I also would say yeah. it's the second wave of twists because let's True. not forget fucking OG Twilight Zone and the other one Outer Limits. For sure. There were things based entirely on now there's going to be a twist here. Now stay for mm -hmm. the twist. Right. Um, but it wasn't those weren't blockbuster movies didn't often do that. Right. And if that's the the actual I guess game of that of those series then it's I think it's okay if they're just like watch for the twist, try to guess the twist. I think generally like that's a bad way to make a lot of movies. Like the best plot twists are the ones where you're just not expecting them. Obviously that's why it's, it's a twist. just a movie. Yeah, yeah. You didn't need to have a twist. Can bear that today with like the Argyle trailer that in the trailer, they're like, you no, tried refuse. not to spoil the twist. It's got a twist. And watching the trailer, I we know, know what, the twist. <laughs> we know the twist. So it's like, you can't do that and also have written it so badly that, we know the twist from the trailer. Then I'm just like, oh, okay, I don't need to watch this movie. So, like, they've started resting on it. But, like, I remember the trailers for the game just being more like, yeah, straightforward thriller. And uh, just to get right into the twist, this is yeah. probably one of this. I mean, this is like a Criterion film, right? Like, this, this is, is considered yeah. a good film. Um, but before <laughs> it was, before you know, the thing that made it a good film to me is just, being like i i never realized you could do that kind of twist the twist is actually anticlimactic the twist is actually it's it's the ds9 episode 
It was just a just, dream. It's all fine. It's the thing we said it's at all the a beginning. Game. It's yeah. all just a game. What? What did oh, you? Oh, move along home. Yeah, move along home. Um, it's only there a never game. were any stakes. It was all fine. Yeah, yeah. And it's a little different from like Total Recall, which you know, like, isn't exactly just like one hundred percent in the game. It kind of leaves it a little bit open. Right. Yeah, but very similar in that it's a vacation that comes to you, and it's a total mind fuck. I, w- I was mm-hmm. thinking of Total Recall a lot while watching this, actually. I hadn't yeah. seen it before. In fact, I'm so ignorant, I kept thinking, this is really Fincher-esque, like, the whole time. <laughs> yeah. the, That's oh, great. Final sure credit. Is. Yeah. Yeah, it's, um, I think the reason it gets away with that, the anticlimacticness of it, is one is, I think they sort of know the whole time that you're thinking that. It's in the back of your mind, right? Where you're like, oh, what if it is just still the game? That's the whole point. Well, eventually, that's all you're thinking is, I'm sure this is part of the game because everything has been. So the only question is, when will the game unravel? And they really get you because they do a false unravel. Yes. That's what's Uh, brilliant about it. Yeah, they do a fake out where you're like, oh, it is a game and it's going to end sad. And then... And then they're like, ah, it is a game, and that was part of the game, too. And they planned it still. Right. They're so good at this, you know, and because, which is funny. And oh, really, yeah. just because the movie ends with him taking Christine to the airport for coffee, for all we know, that's still part of the game. You don't know. <laughs> yeah, Michael right. Douglas is never going to get out alive. But that, I guess I think that's the point, ultimately, and why the movie gets away with it. Because the other thing about this movie, I think famously so at this point, is that any rewatch, second rewatch, third rewatch, even the first watch, if you think about it for more than a minute, you're like, wait, none of that makes sense. <laughs> right? Yeah, there's m- multiple moments where it's like, that can't be done. This is too much. Like the the uh, leash is too large on Michael Douglas. Like they were like, well, he had watchers. You're like, in Mexico? Right. In Mexico, the kindness of strangers getting him home, were those all people that you had? Did they you know knew? exactly where he's going to jump at the yeah. end? Yeah, that's yeah. wild to me. You knew that he was going to track that actor down at the zoo and take right. him at gunpoint? You what, knew that. Yeah, what you realize is that because they do this thing at the end where he's like, what are you doing? What's that? And he goes, it's the bill. And he looks at it and he goes like, oh my God. Like even Michael Douglas, this extremely rich man is like, Wow. And so you could say in your mind, yes, it is the most it is the most thorough LARPing experience anybody's ever made. Meaning that like when he goes to jump to his death, there were nets and other things to catch him and everything was made out of rubber and it was like designed perfectly right. so that it didn't matter where he jumped when he was <laughs> they in Mexico. They paid a bunch of hawks. Well, and they to try to get that they get that one line in with the actor saying if you didn't jump I was supposed to push you. Right. So the, it just implies okay, so they had backup plans upon backup plans. Right. They're this all on walkies. Vast larping network yeah. and Which like is- Yeah, I love that in movie making that like as long as you address it, some of the plot holes kind of go away. Like it is a good gloss over. It's a gloss over. It's it's kind of like it is a little bit putting a lampshade on it, but at the same time, it's like they've addressed it and they do it multiple times and they give it care. So at least I don't feel like I'm being absolute because like with other films and you know things out there, TV shows especially, it just comes out of nowhere. You know, like the stereotypical like person who just who disappears for most of the second half of act two comes back comes right back when our hero is about to get yeah. shot gets shot in the back and it's just like that kind of shit makes me feel insulted as a viewer this at least they're like writing to the assumption that the intelligence of the viewer is a little more higher i would argue a right. little but there is stuff that strains credulity True. completely like the True. assassination attempt where they don't just shoot at them a few times. They come in with Uzis and spray the place down with bullets. It Like the squib control in order to do that. It's funny because they did it for the movie, meaning it probably was squibs and blanks. Because right, yeah, they yeah, wouldn't yeah. use live fire on the movie. But... Uh, they it like predicted where they would go like they knew which way he would run to flee you know because that's where they planted more squibs i just couldn't get over the assassins not killing him like how do they fail right. to kill him there's also how the, they know which tire he would shoot and yeah what if with he the pi with the tire. gun yeah was that gun actually loaded so that when he fired it or what did they have squibs in all four tires where there people watching and someone and, like, goes oh, like, what if he pop number he one shot? 
the window out, you know? Well, so all the now all the tires are rigged, now all the windows are rigged, now every piece right. of the car is rigged. It's, it's just a... And the other thing that glosses over that, like we said, is you look at the receipt, but we don't get to see the receipt. So you can imagine that it costs a billion dollars if you want. You can imagine right. any amount of money, right. and that's supposed to make you think... Well, I guess I just, I mean, with that money, the money, see, they could do it with that much money. It's that, and it's also the idea that it's combined with all these psychological tests that they have, like, perfectly figured out his actions in any given situation. And then you have to assume that they lock down entire streets. Like, when, when he gets in the cab and the cab goes on a rampage, like, they, they, presumably, they lock down those streets. The thing, though, like, there's still, like, whole, like, the lawyer. How is the the lawyer does isn't in on it because if he were was that would be a really big breach like legally right. for his lawyer to be tricking him like that and at the end his lawyer says like I don't know what this is all about but you throw a hell of a party so that means his lawyer is also tangentially being fucked with he didn't sign any waivers so his lawyer could in theory sue the pants off of these people off of CSR also. Yeah. Well, CSR can't exist as a company because even if you sign a waiver, you can't sign a waiver that says you can attempt to murder me. That won't hold up in court. It's right. Or still drug a breach me of law. or right. entomb me in a you grave. You can't just get someone to sign that. It's like, ha ha ha, you, you put your name on the line, man. I can mm-hmm. drug you and entomb you in Mexico right. in a David Byrne suit. And sometimes the actual technology uh, strains you know, reality a little bit. Like at one point, a very small stakes one. It wasn't like staging a coke orgy or sending a dog to attack Michael Douglas, but he uh, a payphone rings and replays sound clips from literally thirty seconds ago of him on the street. Like that is that is to me I that's almost like the harder DIT, than the turnaround the squib on thing. the edit is. Yeah, yeah, you have to right. edit it. You have to like play it on. Like there's just too much shit to do in thirty seconds. But the, apparently they're the best in the business. The baby. one that really gets me like that is. He accidentally shoots his brother through the chest with a squib that is so powerful that it blows up the champagne bottle in his hand. I guess you can do that. And Yeah, there's a squib in the bottle, I assume. There's a, yeah, I guess there's a squib in the bottle. They knew that he would shoot him in center mass, not in the head. Uh, or they had somehow like backup plans on backup plans and squibs all over his head and body anywhere. And... Then he jumps to his presumed death, lands in a big cushion, and is fine. And his brother is there going, ha, 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 we got you. How did Conrad get down that fast? He, he was, probably he grappled. He, he, would, he, did he like needed a, to descend yeah, the building as quickly as a man falling, free falling. Yeah. That, for some mm-hmm. reason, that tiny thing bugged me the most. Oh yeah, yeah. It's just a little stuff an like actor that to a place. Yeah, it's almost all, always not necessarily because they put a lot of work into the death-defying stunt stuff. But it's the small things where that's where the game would crack because they didn't. You don't have perfect control of everything all the time, right? And it's the little details that would really fuck the game up. I would, but you know, it's magic. It's fun. I was about it's, to say. I would argue ultimately none of this matters, and I'm glad we right. started with it um, because. From a writing perspective, the idea is to escalate it enough. Like, this movie is broken up into nice... It's very efficient. I, of course, was paying attention to the structure, which is that, like, the first half of it, you you kind of are like, ah, I get it. It's a game. They're play- Like, they're very loudly playing it like a game. Like, it's a ad- little LARP adventure. And then exactly at the halfway point, do you start going like, wait, this shit can't really be a game. And they do that on purpose. And so they kind of have to cheat like the him firing the gun that the PI has mm-hmm. like that has to like, those are the little things where you're like, well, surely that's a real gun. Right. Um, the reveal is so stupid ultimately that it's not, but like they want, they need us to believe that he is in fact in danger. And it makes that's one thing about the rewatch that makes it tough because you realize ultimately you're watching two hours of a guy getting fucked with by an improv group. Like they're just theater yeah. kids it's and improv, improv people. anywhere X rated. Yeah, yeah, they're just they're just like yeah, just Broadway actors who, who and 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 like stand up comedians and improv dudes who are just need money. It reminds me actually of like like I always love to think about it from the perspective of them or like the news the news guy because that news anchor 
who participates in the he game. He was obviously paid an obscene amount of money to do yeah. this because he's the normal <coughs> news anchor who's on the news regularly. Right. And now he has to look at a little security camera and have a real conversation with a billionaire. Yeah, that is so, That's a breach of so many journalistic integrity things. It re- they must have paid him a ton, right, yeah, to get him to it, do that. It reminds me of like Bob... Bob's Burgers episodes where Mr. Fish Odor has Bob like go to like this weird island of rich people with him like where it's just rich people and it's true it's like if you have enough money you can just get anything done right yeah, and so mm-hmm. this anchor is going to have this story about like how one time he had to do improv with a rich guy for like for a the, rich person just game. for like three minutes and he got yeah. paid five, 500 grand or some shit yeah yeah, I feel like just taking a shit ton of peyote is probably much easier than this <laughs> game, you know, and probably oh, has yeah. the same effect where he's oh, like, oh, fuck, I've been an asshole. <laughs> loosening him up, yeah, because that's yeah. ultimately also what the movie presupposes, because they do a good job setting up that he has a tedious, unimportant life. I love when his ex-wife calls and he takes a message and it was her saying happy birthday and he's at the office alone. Yep. Uh, yeah. It's I- pretty straightforward stuff, but it gets you to know what we're doing here that he's like a grim humorless asshole and by the end it seems to have loosened him up this game and i gotta say no he would be irretrievably broken like his sense of what is real and what is not real and what's dangerous and what isn't dangerous is shattered forever don't you think yeah, I, yes. Yeah. He's not going to just loosen up and be a cool dude like he would if he took a bunch of peyote. He's going to be looking over his shoulder the rest of his goddamn life. This yeah, is... and he's going to be like, anything is possible. And they want, right. like, because they could easily have done the thing that I thought they did because their resources are large enough that they could just steal and, uh, you know, cover up. Well, that's the, the stealing leg of, of his $600 million. Right. Yeah. Making yeah. the game, pretending that the game is a con is brilliant because it throws you off the track of it just being a game. I right. actually think that is a really good move. But as Abe says, it's a totally workable con. That is a real con. And in they fact, have to prove they can do it. <laughs> they do have all his numbers now. So the only mm-hmm. thing keeping them from stealing his money is that they don't do that because they're just an improv troupe. But like, he <laughs> but has to go couldn't? change all his passwords now because he did compromise all his passwords. That's yeah, he's true totally that. compromised. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and he, he knows that there's people in his influence that he trusted now that are willing to be bought to turn that's against true him. Too. That's yeah. another well, thing that's, that he has to deal with. Yes and no, right? Because none of his personal friends are in on it ultimately i like did, right. this is, doesn't this know, is yeah. yeah this is what i wanted to talk about the most because doing a rewatch of this obviously like it's fun to think about like wow they couldn't have done any of that but thinking about the game as what it means therapeutically and what the film is saying and how it's saying it i think is really cool upon rewatch obviously very intentional because the clown is posed like his dead father was there's a bunch of imagery that recreates or echoes the idea of his dad committing suicide by jumping off uh they are clearly picking that scab and rubbing salt in that wound intentionally yeah at the end his brother says i had to do something you were becoming such an asshole <laughs> I, such I, a great line. yeah i wrote a cracked um today's topic about how this is just a christmas carol like the entire really oh yeah it's scrooge movie. yeah he's a scrooge um, and just watching the thing that really popped out watching this is specifically um it's a lot in the sound design it's it's showing i think it's ultimately like the therapy that he's being given is about his relationship with the outside world um with crowds specifically and with opening himself up so like i i think that's the point of the ending is like that fear of like how do you trust anything and it's sort of like i think that's the whole point that's why he was like the first they they do it so well in the first i believe two shots of him is him i think it's three shots because he gets up then he eats breakfast standing with his housekeeper doesn't talk to her there's complete silence and then he walks out of his house in this wide shot complete silence and it shows this this isolation immediately Mm -hmm. um and then they they start doing these scenes. They do it. Uh, he's mostly alone in almost all the beginning part. And then His once money the game isolates him, yeah, 
Yeah, once the game begins, they show him at the airport, and it's really crowded, and they specifically start making him seem very paranoid. He's looking at everybody. Everybody is a suspect, right? Right, um, and I like that there's a moment where he actually smiles, where he's like, this is the game. This is fun. Yes. I like being paranoid. Yeah. Which um, is kind of like makes it really a precursor to Fight Club, um, because mm-hmm. it's attacking this kind of sleepy contentedness, which they both do. Uh, it's like a Huxleyan kind of you know um, display of society society where pleasure and consumerism has kind of taken over and we have lost our soul you know right. like and that's the setup for both of the things this is just happens to deal with a billionaire versus you know the average joe You're right and it, it's also him traveling right he's at an airport he has to get somewhere he's completely in control meaning that he doesn't need you know he he his pen explodes and he gets in the car later and he has shirts re- ready for him yeah so it's this man who doesn't have to engage with the world and in, and at the most, it's paranoia. Him being like, who's going to fuck with me out there? And that's how he begins. And they, they put it... Like, even the sound design, it's very, like, echoey and kind of... There's, like, kind of creepy music. And everybody's a suspect. And you... Howard Shore, by the way. Is it? The Re- yeah. Yeah, Howard Shore is the I music. I was not hot on the score. I thought they relied <laughs> on the tinkling dissident piano too much. It made mm. it just feel like nighttime jazz was happening all around the movie and sort of smeared over it but i love howard shore so i mean lord of the rings yeah i mean oh yeah i think i think he personally my opinion on howard shore is that he's a very solid composer who did lord of the rings and nailed it (laughs) you know like Mm -hmm. he that's it's a great it's so amazing but like there's nothing else on his i don't know maybe there's a few uh, maybe i'm not remembering but he doesn't have like a crown jewel besides lord of the rings yeah. yeah oh yeah um, but you take that scene and then you they mirrored it almost exactly at the same point towards the end where he has to travel. He's in a large crowd, but he's in Mexico and he has to actually <laughs> suddenly the crowd is his savior. Like they, well, they completely change his relationship with he's a eating, crowd. He's eating a street taco, which yep. is like the most normal guy thing you've seen him do in the movie so far you're like yeah oh he's he got flip-flops on he's in mexico eating a street taco he's kind of a normal guy right now in this moment right he's serving the bare necessities as opposed to his life he's just eating a taco like we all need to do and he's embracing strangers because he has to he relies on strangers he relies on them and he appreciates them and the whole journey is sort of that so it makes sense at the end where this moment of like can he even trust this? Does Is it still in the game? It, it's sort of about him having to let go of this guardedness of like guarding, gets, not trusting the world, right? Um, he gets such a free ride because I want to yeah. acknowledge that at the end, like first off, they all celebrate him being less of an asshole and give mm-hmm. him a standing ovation. That's hilarious. But also the man he fired... Yes, came it's back just like, and it's fine. thanks him and says like my life is better because of your cruelty right uh and he's just like hey man good to see you. <laughs> yes. yeah and he wasn't in on the game he, he wasn't in on the game he, he just this now just... seeing how it all worked out he happens to be pleased well, I he wish... wants to go sailing yeah. yeah yeah i wish they he was like hey my life's better now also they paid me a bunch of money uh, yeah, right. So because I'm happy. Of, yeah, because that's if, again. If I was Michael Douglas, I'd be like, "You saw, I walked in on this guy's family and threw porno at him. I freaked out. Like yeah. you should be more upset about this. It bothers me that you are right. You're ruining my fucking reputation. Um, but again, we're supposed to assume he's been he's been scrooged, you know. And part well, of that yeah. is chipping away at his money and at his status, and reminding him in the end he is just one guy. That's all he is, right? Like by taking slowly taking away what's important to him superficially, it's supposed to right forcing make him, him to go into a diner and ask people for a ride and hitchhike with truckers. These are all humanizing experiences. But that begs the question, couldn't they just have immediately drugged him and taken him to Mexico? Because that's where all the growth happened. Because the therapy also has to do with how he gets into it, specifically through a waitress, right? Because they show show him several times before that and how he deals with helpers. And he just doesn't think, he doesn't talk, he says thank you. 
Um, but but he, he says like things like I don't like her, yes. well, you know, and stuff like that. Like and, he needs them to be to his standard as opposed to just a person, right? And so it's specifically catered to him, and they know that, so they're like, let's open up his world via a waitress, someone he's not thinking about. He suddenly has to, and they show like that grows his consideration for just the people around him that he used to see as below him is to show like this person has a whole life and a personality and you like them even though it ends up that she's doing a character so it's weird but like that's that's the point of the therapy right is like i have a question hmm. is mexico in on it yes is everyone that helped him the goodness of strangers was a fiction the president of mexico um, because no, that's a if that's true that's antithetical b that's a loose leash I think, on you know his his the important part of his journey i think what uh, they i think really what they want us to think is that mexico is legit and they're like they're like a larping group but they're a little more like loose you know what i mean where it's like i'm sure there were people from afar watching him to make sure he's okay but they understand that this but is the process i do yeah. think they were like in this part of the journey we drop him in mexico with the watch he still yep. has an expensive watch and we we observe from afar while he makes his way back to san francisco i think and so they, too and they're just kind of assuming that that's what he's going to try to do and they're assuming he'll succeed he's i succeed. i guess if he's not succeeding they might step in as and a character add a new right. thing. And, yeah, that's yeah. I think you have or, to assume that. And I assume that if like someone just stabs him and takes the watch, they're like, "Well, he signed that waiver, so." <laughs> We're good. I also love that the wa- the watch thing. So, I just want to take a moment and clarify with some things the watch thing where you know he goes to like the passport office and he's like i don't have a passport i have nothing i got robbed you know because he doesn't want to go into i'm being the game yeah. uh and he says he and then is the guy notices who could be a plant by crs is yeah. like that if you have a watch like that you don't need um you know passport. like passport problems you have no passport problems but that's not how passports work he still needs to have proof of all of the things that he is who he is he can get a fake one made and i love how the movie shows mexico is a place that you just have busloads of illegal immigrants coming to america like it's a greyhound because are all these people like did, yeah, right. at some point like they did just he go no, through they've, the they've official all, channels? They're all billionaires who are being gamed. They're all yeah. It's a bus for this, the it's company. A, it's a CSR yeah. shuttle. It's they just yada, a, yada a yada very that. white. Well, I mean, I say white, but I mean, I guess it's just a very like Ameri- America centric rather is probably a better way of saying it. it I think interpretation, a rich interpretation of how immigration works. I think it's a re- it's a real hand wave where they're like, I don't know, he probably had to take a bus or something. You know, like the, you could yeah. you could fill in the blanks and go like that bus was probably to like a station where he got out and had to like climb a fence and cross the border maybe. Mm. But like they they really yada yada that shit of like you get it. You get it. He gets on yeah. a bus or whatever. Yeah, sh- uh, I mean, it, like they just show him like hitchhiking. I mean, I guess maybe they just didn't want to show like he got a really good forgery and it, they didn't want to show fooled. him sucking that dick. You know, he had to yeah, suck dick yeah. for that yeah. truck fooling ride. the yeah. uh, immigration officer at the uh, border. We know I mean, that, I guess Michael, that happened. Michael Douglas goes down. We know that about him. We know that. That's in fact, true. to his that's why he has detriment. such a low, gruff voice. That's what it'll yeah. do to you, man. Mm-hmm. He's Catherine got a great Zeta voice, Jones. doesn't he? <laughs> she dips beneath the lasers. Um, yeah, <laughs> dips beneath the lasers. This movie could have been called Falling Down. Uh, interesting point. Thank oh, you, Michael. Yeah. There's some moments where it was like, uh, it felt like falling down. Like at one point, someone tries to carjack him. And he's like, I'm very fragile right, right. now. Yeah, and he just, and he just the pulls gun. the gun. That and is the very guy falling just, down. Yeah. yeah, and the guy just bounces. He's Blink. like, I do not want to fuck with yeah. this guy. That's a solid Michael Douglas right there. S- yeah. So uh, they put the To Kill a Mockingbird book in his place and intentionally left it there, but filled it with blanks, right? So he, they didn't put it there because he knew it was there. It was right? always so, there, but they failed to, but they, they lo- overlooked it intentionally. No, I think they filled it with blanks, right? So it's, they pretended, it's all blanks in the end. They yeah. pretended it was overlooked intentionally. Right. They, exactly. Yeah. 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 Okay. There's not a live gun, according to CRS's, if you believe the CRS thing. There's no live ammunition, I think we have to believe, at any time. Yeah. Um, Even though it's very clear that they have squibs for the, like, yeah, the one one in the apartment building where they have to, like, 
uh, get out and there's like a SWAT team that shoots at him. That's the one that I, I think is really I, there's a few. the reality. The there. dogs, I'm like, what if the dogs, what if he tripped and the dogs got to him? What if he kicked the dogs, dogs to death? <laughs> what or if like, he what if, yeah, what if the that's dogs? the thing. What if he's yeah. a weirdo or he's dumb or he's not good at the game? Like, well, they did the what if he just had test. sex with that clown doll and the newscaster <laughs> comes on is like, hey, I'm talking to you. And he's like, please leave me alone. I'm having sex with this clown doll. It's a game. Don't you <laughs> it's get a it? Game. Yeah, it's <laughs> a game. Yeah. I hear it from the My brother bought test. this for me. I think I, you're supposed to assume that these psychological tests are all encompassing and magic. Uh, right. I did write down four moments that I was like, Michael Douglas is just a dumb character first he does not know how cameras work at one point yes. he sees that he's being f- recorded and he walks around the room for a while watching the monitor in the complete wrong direction Colder, uh, Colder. two yeah. he cuts himself just by pine at glass which is hilarious <laughs> three just outright touches a light bulb that's on for no reason. And he's <laughs> surprised it hurts his face. And he's like, oh. And then the last one is that at one point he yells at a smoke detector, come on out of there. <laughs> <laughs> that is pretty great. <laughs> like they're tiny. He's like a child. <sighs> I think, um, so this, they, they could have leaned into this more because I think they could have used this. The fact that he's so rich. Like, for example, there's a part where detectives show up with his lawyer. And I have to assume the detectives are actors and it works in his favor because he's a man who everything is curated for him anyway, right? That you could very easily just say like, yes, these men are cops and he would just believe it. And so they could have played into that fact that he's this guy who everything is given to him, that he's kind of a dummy for that reason. Mm-hmm. The part for me that I kind of still have trouble believing is when he originally goes to CRS and they test him for like seven hours, it seems like. And why would he stay there? Why would he stay there? They why would a man like that put up with that? It would be a that. waste of his time. Yeah. And they, could, they could have made up for it because they do a scene right after. They do a scene right after where he literally talks about how busy he is. And it's like, yeah, you would not have done that. But then they do a scene where he f- sees like these high status guys talking about the game. And I think if they had just put that before that, where like he realizes like because he cares about uh, other status. rich guys are doing it i may as well do or, it yes i would actually argue that more in theme is if you just developed a scene where it's clear like the um veil kind of disappears and he is terribly unhappy and so so lonely right that nothing is nothing works for him um like if he was a flatliner and he like gets out of the flatline oh, and it's just liner. like uh this is not doing it for me anymore. i actually i really agree with that because i i hate to admit the scene where it's his birthday and he's having like that burger and burger. cupcake and alone one tiny little in his nice place i was like that looks great like a that quiet fries, birthday yeah. alone in my giant cold <laughs> mansion with no one there. That sounds cold. so fucking great. Cupcake I would with love a single that. candle on it. Yeah. Yeah. I want that. I want that for myself. Yeah. Um, yeah. I would. Okay. Well, that. I would mm-hmm. feel. I just feel I would be so good at this, like at the game. At the game? Like, I'm the worst player of games in general, but like, I can't go to escape rooms anymore because I try to hack the system somehow, right. which is terrible. Like, that's the game to me. Uh, Dave, I think you, <laughs> we were all in an escape room the for one crack. Where we got in trouble? We got in trouble escape- multiple times, and I was, I, I was the person who did all of it. For writing uh, on the wall? Because I convinced Tom to write on the wall of yeah, an escape room. I was because there. It's true that we came from an office where those walls with that shine, you could just write on the walls and they rub, rub off. It's their but fault. But that's a bold assumption about no, walls. No, it was their fault. They gave us a dry erase marker or they what did. we thought. And, and, no the, and, no, and no whiteboard. And the walls were all white and smooth. And we just went, oh, I guess we the had to walls do a are problem. the... W- yeah, and they gave us a math but problem. I didn't then they run in and go, Poor don't Tom write did. on the walls, and you guys. They came on the intercom and they just said, please don't write on our walls. Yeah. <laughs> and and Tom we- was destroyed. <laughs> he was just so horrified. And I was like, oops. And I then- totally told Tom, you just write on the wall, dude. <laughs> like, and then at we- confident as hell. And it was then when we rubbed the text and realized like oh that's not coming off it just smears <laughs> yeah in a big rainbow they're yeah. gonna have to do this work and if yeah. we felt bad of course but i don't i still don't feel that bad but that's when you walk into a situation where they say look for twists and turns the system is going to be tricky it's kind of their fault 
Yeah, it's, that's it's what game you're on. Gonna, yeah, it's game, it's game on, on, man. In my mind, but I had never gone to an escape room. Dave, were you in the group at the beginning where they had this like foyer kind of space, probably, where you had to like get into the escape room? And I noticed, and I think I told, I think it was Tom again, and I maybe it was Brendan, but maybe it was you. We brute forced our way into the room, yeah, because we saw that there was a hole there, and they weren't happy about that. I could tell because it was clear as we were opening, it was like, ah, oh, this is not supposed to open, but we can get in the room. And it was just the three of us in the room and everyone else solved the actual puzzle. <laughs> I am. Um, God, I'm glad we're talking about this. Um, Cause yeah, I've had two escape room experiences and one LARPing experience and they've all involved like the one, the one escape room was uh, yeah with you and there's, they really need to get their shit together. If they, ex- it's exactly what Michael's saying. They're presenting this world where it's like anything goes. And then they're like, actually, no, not, anything goes i in fifth grade and this is a long fucking story but if you lived in new england you might have gone to something called nature's classroom which is a camp that you did in um fifth or sixth grade um and it made the news recently because yes. they had oh, what, I was, you, what you did made the no news. <laughs> no they had this they had a underground railroad experience where they you larped as a escaping slave you can probably guess why this made the news today recently yep. Yep. But <laughs> welcome to the 90s where i'm a child and i don't know any of this and i'm i'm living the life of a slave who has to escape and they put us in the room and they say like okay so you're 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 you know, you're, you're a prisoner here and you got to get out. And they were going to send someone in to like LARP the experience. And we just fucking booked it. We like got out the window. Yeah. We were like, we got to get out of here. And like yeah. just ran into the woods and they had to come find us and go like, okay. okay. They, had to, they had to sick the dogs on you to even yeah. find you. <laughs> yeah. And you're like, because is again, this it? Is this part of the experience? They're right, like, no, just, we're just trying to recover you. Right. They told dog. a bunch of kids, like, you got to get out. You're a prisoner. And then they left us alone in the woods. So we're like, we're just fucking, it's, it's that same vibe as like an escape room where they leave you in. You're like, let's get the fuck out of here now. Like just kick down the door, right. Of an escape room. That's oh yeah. How you get I out. went to an escape room where I ended up going, no, you can get under here. You can get under here. And like crawled through this little dusty throughway and pushed some br- boxes aside and stood up. And it's like a prop closet with all the props in it. And they're like, right. no, that's nothing. When we said to force something open, we meant the big crate in the middle of the room. We didn't mean go around the perimeter and open every door that you can right. open and rip grates off and crawl through yeah. things. Right. I don't we know what mean- I don't know. Don't tell yeah. me that then. We tell me that's mean- a better clue. Right. Like you start breaking. Breaking the drywall. <laughs> just, yeah. just kicking at the wall immediately upon them saying start. Yeah. The whole, it's an escape room. It's putting rats in a cage and telling I'm, get out. Every escape. I've only been in one other escape room. It was bad for a different reason where it was like a 20 person escape room. It was like 20 people in a room and we didn't know each other. And so everybody just treated it like a like like i would pick up a clue and someone would like snatch it from my my hands like i got one i got a clue and run away and it was no cooperation and it was just like my <laughs> scattered in a room and oh, no one dude. escaped i did a it was star like, trek one this? where you can only advance through cooperation and that's just as bad trying yeah. to cooperate with a team of 20 people who are strangers and they all have different thoughts about status and right. different people try to be the leader and you're like look we just need four people to put their hands on these switches at the same time it doesn't matter who's the leader per se right but it yeah it's you realize so that as- i think early yeah. escape rooms realize that and they scaled down where they're like okay we need rooms that like five friends get to do right yes right it's yeah, like when karaoke and- started to be private booths and you're like that's what this should have always been right that <laughs> and karaoke hustling obviously yeah and i think we're all all of us can say that we feel bad about our escape room antics it's mainly yep. just for the people who work there who have to clean up these messes right. but i also but blame them but I, I uh, but I blame the creators of the the game. I mean, we are to blame somewhat. But like, yeah. hey man, I don't know. You didn't prep me enough. You told me to think outside the box. If this Michael is what Douglas it looks like. had had really accidentally killed Conrad, it would be a totally justifiable murder. Or like, yeah, any, yeah. anyone he accidentally kills, it's kind of on you, the designers of the game, not Which, him. I love like that involuntary they... manslaughter at the most. Yeah. That's why it's such a good meta moment because they even have 
um, the actor go like, we are so going to jail. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> like oh fuck like and this it, is a bad thing we've done right it feels like a genuine moment um alarming and, amount of or lack of safety yep because they do have a line where they mention there's an emergency hotline which he never calls which is hilarious because we oh, almost yeah. all, immediately are thrown into the suspicion that the that crs is against him so he wouldn't call the people that are taking his money but they give him that hotline but even early, I would, if I was Michael Douglas and I had any intelligence about this kind of thing whatsoever, there should be something a little bit more elaborate or less elaborate than that. Like, there's no safe word, literally no safe word, where it's just no, like that's eject. The point. Yeah, I guess that's the point because you have to live on the edge. It's, it's being done to him. <laughs> like, it, this company I mean, should not exist. No, yeah, if he is- didn't think to use that crank to crank down the cab window, someone at one point does say there were divers. There were divers. But, but he'd I probably still, still die. You'd be drowned, though. He, the, the divers could They'd have to get his in. corpse. They, yeah. No, yeah. yeah, that's the, the So what if he didn't bring the handle or something like that? Yeah, what no, if he just I, looked I assume, at the handle and was like, fuck this? As yeah, he's I drowning, he, he dive, goes, well, oh, that handle, of course. Blah, 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 blah. blah. <laughs> I assume <laughs> the divers would have air to give him. And I and then I wonder, like, would they t- or drag him out and go like, all right, we're done. Like this yeah, was all game being over. Part of the game. game, right? You lost, you lost the game. You lost the game, and then it's like it's the biggest risk in the world to piss off a man this rich in general. Like, yeah, like right. I think again, these are the things that they. I I do think they considered it, which is why it's his brother doing it. Um, by the way, there's a, that's another really good scene. Is the bir- the the birthday lunch kind of encapsulates mm. everything. If, mm-hmm. Did you notice that? Because his yeah. brother comes in, takes him out of his comfort zone, and then tricks him to have his surroundings suddenly everybody sings happy birthday to him. And that's essentially the entire movie in a, a scene. Yeah, he just yeah. ran a And small he's game. smoking a cigarette in that scene, which you're not allowed to. So it's like, I'm yep. coming into your system, I'm fucking it up, and I'm bringing a gamified version of it that you hate to bear. Right. But yeah. it's a but game it, that connects you to other human beings. I'm forcing these other human beings to be around you, looking and they, at you. to acknowledge me as your brother, et cetera, et cetera. And yeah. I, th- I think that seems really important because they show that Michael Douglas, this is clearly the only person he tolerates whose mm-hmm. bullshit he deals with. So it kind of has to be him at the end who has done it all because that's the only way he would I think, accept this. He, yeah. He would oh, man. What if, Ans- what if Anson Bear did this to him as a comeuppance for how he's being fired or whatever? He'd be like, I'm going to bury you, man. I'm going to yeah. sue you so hard. You're going to be dead. Yeah. I'm going to literally bury you. In, in, yeah. Like you if it didn't me. go well and he didn't have the realization didn't to be have a better a fun guy. Time, right. Like he, it just ended prematurely. He would just ruin everyone's lives. Well, I think it's, it was way more realistic for the game game to end and him to go still no still i didn't like still, that yeah you still yes. shouldn't have done that yeah that i don't really feel like up. a better man i feels like someone who'd been fucked with thoroughly but right. that's why ultimately it is a christmas carol. no party it's a, <laughs> right it's a magic movie it's magic it's, it's scrooge could have done that scrooge you know? could have woken up and been like what would a, what that was a fucked up dream fuck those ghosts. all right fuck back ghosts. to yeah <laughs> fuck those ghosts i hate ghosts i'm gonna sue ghosts yeah they had they that you just have to sort of take it on faith that like it's the christmas right, magic it's magic yeah. it's a magic and so like watching it for the efficiency of just telling talking about his character and having to ex- put all this bullshit in here i i just found it very impressive like even the um the fake out they use the fake out when she goes like oh my god it's real don't shoot your brother to yeah. explain how they did it so that after the twist you don't have to have a scene where someone explains it like that's yeah, really that's yeah effective. yeah that's well, really efficient well structured there's a lot of efficiency in how they in how there's they a lot of efficiency together. and good work in this which is why it was surprising to me that fincher has said in multiple interviews that he's not proud of it and that his wife is right, right that he shouldn't have made it and he says it's because i thought you could make the act three fun just by going full bore hand on the throttle but it doesn't make sense i get and, it and what's funny is he says that as if it's a negative I think he's right. You can go full bore on the throttle and it will make nonsense palatable. Yeah. People liked this movie. The game is good. I like this movie. It doesn't matter. It's like we like the Joker, even though the Joker's plans don't make any sense. 
uh, mm-hmm. he's sort of Christopher Nolaning us here, and even if he's embarrassed by that, it totally works. It's there's one of those. So much, there's so much distracting stuff for you to look at that you don't care that it doesn't make sense. And in fact, on second watch, where you're unraveling all the ways it doesn't make sense, that's almost like a fun game in and of itself. And yeah, I get it's joy from that. It's relevant that we covered Arrival recently on this po- on these podcasts on Escape mm-hmm. from the Multicurse, just because we talked about in that episode about how like the thematic kind of structure of it, like where it's re- relative to the story being told, is kind of you know relevant to the structure itself and the way it's constructed fincher said in an interview and this is a quote movies usually make a pact with the audience that says we're going to play it straight what we show you is going to add up but we don't do that in that respect uh, it's about movies and how movies dole out information and it's kind of playing the same game where it's just like what if we take your assumptions and then we fuck with that and then you have to unlearn your kind of assumptions of some specific And you have to things. make a new set right. of assumptions. Like, yeah. we're going to play with your assumption that it is a game in order to can to do the last kind of... Like, it's almost inevitable at this point. Like, I, can't, I couldn't see an ending, which they wrote and almost shot, where it is not a game. It goes right. too far. I mean, it was a game, but it goes too far, and they didn't plan it enough, and uh, he just, Michael Douglas just dies and kills his brother. Uh, they decided that that was too... Uh, <laughs> too it's dark. Too raw. And it doesn't yeah, matter. Yeah, which is probably right, you know, yeah. but it's it's because this movie is truly about making you unthink how your assumptions in every moment where you go like, but is it, are you, are you gaslighting me or are you just gaslighting him? And we're supposed to just see a guy get gaslighted or am I the audience member getting gaslighted right. by the movie? Right. And that's a fun little game to play. And it, and it's less, it's interesting. Cause it, it reminded me like I'm, I'm writing a script right now that deals with time travel and I'm getting really lost in the details of that. And w- watching this movie made me realize like, Oh yeah, you, it doesn't matter. <laughs> As just long keep as your moving movie's ahead fun. at a healthy clip. Yeah, yeah, yeah just keep people, it moving. Keep it people moving. People will enjoy it. And but there's a weird difference to me between how this movie tricks us because it's you're right. This is a kind of about tricking how movies trick you. Uh, how you make a you kind of make a um, deal with a movie that it's going to make sense. And then usually we get mad when it breaks that deal. So why didn't mm-hmm. this make me mad? Whereas for example. And I know I sort of know the answer from at least this example is with the sixth sense is about that. Right. It's it's also hiding right. something from us. But it does that, I would argue, through like editing. Like there's mm-hmm. a scene, the, you know, the, the scene where he's omission. Bruce Willis, yeah, omission. Bruce Willis is hanging out with the, the kid's mother and they we cut into the scene. You just assume like, oh, he must have interacted with her. But then you mm. learn later she didn't. And the only reason we know that is because the movie omitted And that. that feels cheap because it's like, ah, I didn't tell you all the information you exactly. needed. And it's like, well, okay, yeah, you can tell me a, a unrelated thing. And then I don't know the answer when you quiz me on it, of right. course. And speaking this- of Arrival, Arrival does the same thing where they show you the very first set of footage they show you. All, all you assume is that it took place in the present. That that's why we're watching it at the beginning. That's our time orientation. This right. is Spoilers. the present. Yeah. Spoilers for Arrival. The twist is, no, that footage is from a different time entirely. It's from the far future. Uh, right. There's so many ways to... It's cool because there's so many compacts that we've made. Like No Country for Our Old Men takes the classic, if you're going to see the hero die, you're going to see him die, and, and fucks with that. Right. You, any any pattern that you can identify the audience thinks of as a compact with the filmmaker, you can now val- avoid that contract, and that always makes for something interesting. I think what makes it work for me is if you can think of justification. Like, for example, Rival, right. um, there's a justification there, right? Because it's about time. And it's about right. like how we s- can show time, and Out it, of it, order it time. and it's sort of just like, hey man, I didn't tell you, I did, we didn't tell you this is in order, did we? We yeah. no, no one mm-hmm. ever said that. So like, it's about time. So it kind of and like, No Country for Old Men is kind of about the anticlimacticness of that violence, um, and it's part of the point. Whereas like the Sixth Sense, if you asked him why he did that, you could argue. So the problem is like, you could argue like, well, it's from Bruce Willis's perspective. But it's not. The movie is not from his perspective. It changes right. perspectives. So ultimately, it feels like he's just like, well, I needed you to not know. You know, like, right. um, 
so like if there is a if there is an artistic reason i guess with the game it's sort of i mean it, it, if you think of it as like yeah a metaphor for how movies just generally trick you i mean the deconstruction of it is great like if you've seen f for fake or anything by andy kaufman right. you know it's like uh, as orson welles famously said like all storytellers are liars that's our job to lie to you um and it's i love that that is the kind of presumption of um like i think why it works the game works for me in this regard is because they treat me intelligently enough kind of like what i was saying earlier about just like by filling the tiny little holes i stop thinking about why i go oh well this movie is kind of like moving at a clip and at a pace and uh, you know respecting my intelligence then i'm gonna stop asking that question that really is like I ask on, uh, you know, less worthy films, I would argue, where it's just like, well, why is that true? Why am I, why, why is that assumption right. being made? And then I almost get to the end quicker than, uh, than they do because they, ha- they telegraph it because they are like, well, we have to make it obvious at a certain point. And it's like, well, it's going to only go one way with this one. You, I remember the first time I watched this movie, I truly didn't know what was going to happen. And in that way, I think, and I think Fincher acknowledges that he succeeded in that, yeah. even though he doesn't love, he, do- he didn't think he should have made this film that's a different statement from you know like this film has Nothing some good worked. stuff in it right yeah yeah i think he really did succeed in the audience at large is going like well even though it's so obvious by the end you're like maybe it isn't a game like maybe even the game the is answer, gonna go bad like, it's always a game they said it's always gonna be a game it's been yeah, a game I every time you. i'm an idiot There's, it's I amazing it. how at least three times they make you go maybe it isn't a game right and then yeah. you feel so dumb when it's a game <laughs> I and i love think that. they also know like i think that fake out ending is them recognizing like that you know, they know the audience has probably been constantly being like, is it a game or not? I think it's a game. Maybe it's not a game. And doing that double fake out. I think if it had just ended with really him, sells it. Yeah. If it had just ended with like, it's a game and he shoots his brother and kills himself. I wouldn't have liked it as much because it does need that other layer, not just because the other layer makes it happy again, but because it's like, that's the obvious, the most obvious way it could end. Right. And the least obvious way the whole movie could end in my opinion is that it is a game and also it's fun <laughs> and it's right. fun. Yeah, like it's that's, a, the, it's lo- fine. that's yeah. the least expected idea <laughs> is like oh it'll be a game but it'll be like an ironic twist this or it's a great a game. time yeah, yeah. The, the, you never expect it'll end with him being like i had fun this was good yeah this changed me i've been scrooged yeah, yeah. it's so good there's it's also so good. this element of like going on the meta thing about why that works thematically with Michael Douglas, which is like, yeah, stop worrying. Enjoy things. Just enjoy things. It's sort of what they're saying to him and to us. Um, I think the problem, like they also have this slight Alice in Wonderland theme, right? They, they actually have the um, Jefferson airplane song. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it's very much trying to present itself like that. The problem with that is watching it again, I realize it's kind of just a series of like, and then this, and then this, and then this, and then this, much like Alice in Wonderland is. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think after you know the twist, and if you're not like a weird little freak trying to analyze what it all means, if you're just rewatching it for entertainment, it probably drags for that reason. Because you sort of know you're just watching LARPers and you're like, oh, okay, this isn't really... Like right. once you know that, I I assume for people who aren't, you know, like really into the movie or wanting to think about mm. it more, which is perfectly fine. It's like I don't rewatch this movie casually for this reason, where it's like, eh, you kind of you know what it is. So yeah, the twist I, I just, unwinds it to some degree. Although I think it's interesting looking at it from the modern day perspective, because especially with shows like Succession having existed. Because they're like the this opening the same, of this. This has the same, same intro. Opening. It has yeah. the same intro eight successions. Millimeter. Yeah, eight millimeter yeah. home videos with piano plinking. And it's like a sad tale of isolated rich people. Um, so it's interesting to me just in this day and age to watch a movie where the plot is, can uh, God, I hope this it works out for this billionaire. God, I hope this billionaire gets a happy life and can be happy again. Yeah. Yeah. It's Very like, nice. fuck him. Like, fuck this guy. Yeah. Why should Especially we root for him? Especially there's a few, like, there's a few moments, like, 
through it because his realization only comes at the end and he's an asshole kind of the whole way through i mean rightfully so when they start like taking his money and threatening his life but there's like times where it's still like it's still believably the game and right. michael douglas takes a moment to like as they're out running the dogs <laughs> He turns he turns to the waitress and is like, My shoes are two thousand dollars. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I love it. There no, he said, There goes a thousand dollars. Your shoes are thousand dollars. That one was a thousand dollars. Right. Oh, yeah. Also, by the way, the the actress, De- uh Deborah Kara Unger, uh, mm-hmm. who plays the waitress, I forget the name. Christine. Um yeah. And or Claire at the end, I guess. Um she, she had the exact thing happen. And they had to, like, when they were wa- well, making the movie, they had to go, like, yep, that's the plot hole right there. Because she, when she jumped down and did the stunt to do the dumpster infested with real rats, by the way, because the rats, like, exit. It was just a real uh, dumpster, yeah. She fractured a bone in her foot yep. in the jump. Yeah, and those jumps look totally real. And that totally could have happened. And, oh, I mean, yeah. that would have shut down the game because they would have Douglas. to pull out. Michael Douglas breaks a leg and then, or, like, like not he the hits character. his head, hits his head on the hits side. And, and, dies. Just, and just never gets out of that dumpster. She just does <laughs> the hands in pockets whistling and leaves. Just, and she's like, he was so far from the end. He didn't even yeah, he understand. Was in, yeah. 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 And they it's just, just so they funny. All, they all scatter. Fucking his brother is like, checks in like, hey, what's going on with that? And they're like, he's fine. He won. He won. It's fine. He won the game. His and brother, said, by the way, had to take acting lessons, I assume, because he has. Yeah. A, he's, I mean, Sean yeah. Penn. Is really yeah. He good. gives he's a Sean, Sean Penn performance. Penn. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, I, I'm impressed by a lot of the acting. I mean, I guess that's the improv troupe. But yeah. like he had, he must, I here's the thing I think with his character is his brother, Sean Penn, just loves the game so fucking much. Right. Like something happened in his game I had, that was so foundational because like, and I don't know, we don't know what it is because he is only talking about the game all, every second of this movie. I wanted to talk about that actually because... There's a part where he, you know, he hears people talk about the game and they're, you're, you would kind of assume they're actors, but they could be other rich people who did the game and right. are just like, I don't want to spoil it for you. Um, mm-hmm. They could, they could go, oh, you're going to think it's not the game, but it is the game and they're going to do this big thing. But like, it does seem like the idea is it is life changing. Um, it also made me think about what if they have to do it for a billionaire who is not like very mobile? who can't do all the Michael mm. Douglas stuff that they tested. Yeah. Do, is his game, game just like a lot of sitting Mind and like fuckery. standing still? Yep. Yeah. I, apparently so. Yeah. Yeah. Th- playing chess online. There's got to be some real shitty games that they have to do where they're like, man, this isn't fun. We don't get to like put him in an elevator yeah, or anything. Like that speaking game was which, awesome. Speaking of chess, <laughs> I love when she drugs him, which is the moment where we're supposed to be thinking as the audience, Oh, it isn't a game. This is one of the key moments where you think it's not a game. He right. falls over drunk and knocks over a chessboard. I just like that attention to the detail. Like, oh, yeah. It's not a game. I'm going to flip this game up to show it's not a game. That is really right. great. Yeah. Very intent. A lot of intentional stuff. I, I love know. how they hide CRSs everywhere in the film. Various not just companies. like the obvious ones, yeah. various companies, but also like... There's in the trivia section I read about. I didn't notice, but I went back and look. You remember certs, certs the uh, yeah. the the uh, yeah. you know mouth freshener or whatever. Yeah. Um. They C R S. They cover they cover the E, uh, mm-hmm. and they cover the T so that it's just C R S. <laughs> it's little tiny things like that that yeah. you when you acknowledge and start to like by osmosis see how many how much effort's being put in that's yet another thing where you go like I'm in good hands you know oh, yeah. that's what makes yeah. it feel like a Fincher and you are just there for the ride and I think that a that's Fincher fine. or a Nolan I feel like this showed me yeah. the connection between Fincher and Nolan in a lot oh, of ways yeah. specifically yeah. the Dark Knights I yeah I, this is why I like whenever people uh, both Nolan and Fincher I like Fincher a little more but it, it's weird to compare yeah. Um, whenever people talk about them, like, well, they're actually not that smart. It's like, yeah, no shit. They're making movies. <laughs> they're making fun yeah. movies. That's that's why I like them is because they make fun, interesting movies that are unique um, 
and mm-hmm. sometimes they're dumb. Sometimes they're, they're sometimes I don't they, like they them. They aren't great. But yeah. most of the time I enjoy them and it doesn't matter if afterwards it doesn't make sense. I generally am like, yeah, I had fun. That was fun. I like, I like the prestige worked on me and I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah that's a good movie. Yeah. Movies that totally make sense can also be interesting in a very dry way like Primer or what have you. Oh, yeah. But uh, yeah, movies don't need to make sense. It's a dream. It's a lie. It's a right. phantasm. Mm-hmm. By the way, the hotel at the end is the Ghostbusters, where the Ghostbusters fought Slimer. Oh, nice. It's the same hotel. You mean also, Head? that was Spike Jones, wasn't it? Spike Jones is in this movie as one of the paramedics. Yes. Yeah. That's dope. I didn't know that. Yeah, he's the one The one paramedic who has lines is Spike Jones. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They yeah, must know each go. other from doing music videos, I would imagine. Yeah, one assumes. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, yeah, it's, I, I think that nolan and i mean fincher wasn't the first uh, like it's it always goes back it goes back goes back everyone's standing on the shoulder of geniuses and et cetera, et cetera. but like fincher definitely i think primed us for the nolan era you know what i mean yeah. oh yeah I think so. because of this deconstruction but i mean the early 2000s were full of that like if you look at international cinema too like you got to throw in 21 grams you got to throw in morse paris and an Aratu in there like there's so many people doing we were in love with that shit even before memento you know uh and the non-linearity um which is still a thing like we mentioned you know in 2016 with arrival and you know it's been kind of co-opted with you know like uh, superhero movies too with multiverses this concept of like you not knowing exactly what the reality is or which version uh, of the character you're talking to right yeah it's definitely uh like I wouldn't call it like anthemic of like a problem. Uh, I just say that it's just something that we like once we picked up as a, in the zeitgeist as viewers, we just kind of never put down. It's always going to just be a part of, oh, it's one of those movies. And we like that. We like that when it happens. Right. And we have to. The The problem is that when, as like Hitchcock said, I wouldn't want to be making movies for people in 100 years because they'd know all my tricks. The problem is that after the Shyamalans, after the Nolans and all this stuff and like things like the game we are now ready for it and the lexicon and the syntax of the average viewer is so much higher and more intelligent because of what we've witnessed just the experience and that just brings a kind of natural intelligence to the watching of these things i would say it's at a certain point it's going to get too much you know like and i think there's already been movies that are too much that are too much where it's such a shocking twist that it's almost like an axe flying into the third act of the movie and completely fucking everything. Oh uh, yeah. Where a twist, you know, those twists where you, it becomes, yeah, but that twist undoes everything about the movie. Or it's just and it's right. like, well, it's... that was the only way we could still surprise you was bring something entirely out of left field that you wouldn't think of because it makes right. no sense. Right. It's serenity with Matthew McConaughey or, <laughs> yeah, or hypnotic where, well, you realize those movies, like they don't know. They're making them and they're like, this feels stupid, but maybe it's the coolest thing that everybody maybe has ever seen. This is going to, yeah. we, we can't, the, because and when you think about it, all movies always kind of have, t- like, it's, it's funny. It's like, you, we're so used, like twists are kind of natural parts of movies now where it's like, there's got to be like a little twist. Like if you're making any thriller or something like that, I went and watched, um, what's the one fucking, I just watched Dark Passage with Bogart. Um mm where he plays an an escape prisoner who gets plastic surgery and it's sort of this noir and I don't want to spoil that movie, but it has all these like not twists and turns, but like all these details like, Oh, he got plastic surgery. Oh, who's this person? Oh, these people recognize him. And then the ending is really straightforward. And at the time I was like, wow, really? That's fucking it. And that's kind of what you like the escalation where it's like, it's not actually straightforward. It's a reveal that the killer is this character that you aren't thinking about. That was enough right. for it to be a twist at the time because yeah. there always needs to be mm-hmm. a revelation. And the revelation is just, Oh, it was, it was this character that you weren't thinking about, which now is like, that's not enough, you know, for most things yeah. now. Yeah. And even farther um, back, go to like North by Northwest. And it's just like, just the feeling of being paranoid was enough, you know, like right. that is all that was necessary. You go all the uh, way to knives out where it's like deconstructing the genre where it's like, Oh, right. we're not even gonna, we're, we're going to completely change how murder... Mi- we're going to tell you like what happened. Like, who done it? Yeah, that's, we're going to tell you... Who said this was a who done it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so, like, that's why I do like... Like, A Haunting in Venice was the recent... Where that one is also fairly straightforward, but they add a flavor to it 
um, where like, you know, the end is like, it's this person, dun, dun, dun. But they add like a few twists and turns mm. and make it more like semi-supernatural. So there is, I think, still a way to do it. And I Oh, absolutely. Really... I mean, here's the one thing that we know that's consistent about any art form, any, any kind of genre or, you know, um, stylistic approach that becomes like uh, a big thing in the zeitgeist is that we grow tired of it. And we right. feel that it's hackneyed and cliche because we're now expecting some of the maneuvers of these f- storytellers. Right. And then someone out of nowhere comes and revolutionizes that very thought. And right. then we go, that's genius. And, and now that becomes while. the new thing. Yeah. Right. Yeah, Sometimes for a it's while, just that takes not over. having a twist <laughs> where you're like, huh, all right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, arguably that is, you know, a, a, a type of form is just what if you were expecting a twist because of the way this movie looks and is made and is constructed. And then there's no twists to be spoken of. Like right. that would be doing a similar thing to what this movie's doing or Arrival or many like the sting. A lot of the films that we've been talking about. Right. It's also just ultimately it's trying to show people something they haven't seen before. Right. Whether that yeah. be a really touching and personal story, a joke that makes them laugh that they didn't or a hear before. Fact. Yeah, a mind fuck or or like something scary. So like if I think if your movie has some element of that, then people will put the rest aside if it really works, you know? Mad Max Fury Road doesn't have a twist. It does have a bunch of it shit we haven't the seen other before. It needs, yeah. yeah. Right, yeah, it's just a completely <laughs> different type of movie at that point. And right. it's like, you know, but the but the idea is the same is that y- if you you build up an expectation uh, you can deconstruct it always right. because there's always something to deconstruct because if you can identify a trend and people all agree upon the trend, like globally or at least on balance, then like, it's ripe to be plucked. Then it's right to be. Yeah, exactly. Right. And this, and that's cool. <laughs> yeah. This movie shows you just how fucking far we've gone where it's like, Oh my, right. or how far we need to have gone where it's like, this was made, over 20 years ago and it's like a twist in a twist but the twist is that there is no twist and you're like fuck man how do you make something now <laughs> where it's yeah, like right. it's got everything um and it's it's actually nice to compare did you guys see the killer his other movie yes i saw a killer yeah yeah i stand by that it's a secret comedy but like oh it's not even a secret at yeah, this point I yeah it's I a guess it's, comedy. i would argue it's it's like people still don't think that um Fincher is poking fun at the fight cl- the audience. Oh, right. They're, it's the Serpico, or not Serpico thing, Scarface thing, where it's like, mm-hmm. do you legitimately think that Scarface, like, what do you think is right. happening in that movie? Why do you think it's awesome? Um, I, it's not to be degrading of anyone's opinion of these films, but I think we could all probably agree that, like, Fight Club is trying to deconstruct what it is to like live in your own head right. and convince yourself of extreme paranoia. He's kind of taking down that kind of belief structure that at a certain point is oh, the people that he's kind of uh, trying to, in a way, the movie befriends because it makes a hero out of them. Right. Um, and Fincher, I think, knowingly is deconstructing that and saying like, yeah, but that's not it, though. And I think he's doing the same thing in The Killer. In the killer, yeah. He's like, he's not that cool. He's actually right. the reverse. It's but a comedy. It, it's interesting comparing the two because Fight Club, I feel like, is way more obvious because it's like yeah mm-hmm. tyler dirt is he's the villain he's the bad guy you know um it, it, it's and uh, obvi- like with the book it's even more clear but like with the killer like it doesn't have a moment where it's like no you are bad as much and, i thought it was obvious because i thought every single moment that he oh no he i did thought it said a thing he'd something the other thing would happen oh no like I, thought comedy it, of errors. I thought it was pretty obvious but it doesn't like point to it as much it's more subtle and it feels mm-hmm. like that speaks to how we've gotten more sophisticated where yes. it doesn't need to shout it at us is my point. And, and the, and the storytellers need to adapt and Fincher has t- shown time and time again, the ability to do so, right. which makes him one of the greats. I'd and argue. it's just a lot more subtle this time of like, yeah, his narration is not matching up with what he's doing. Um, it's almost it's a not, tone poem, but about thrillers with twists. Right. But it's not <laughs> yeah. like to such an extreme. It's not like he's slapsticky bad. No. You know what I mean? Yeah. He's just like mediocre. Um, and I just found that interesting that it's like we can, we can get more subtle now. Um, and yeah. Although the final Same conversation man. with the guy who originally put out the order for the kill 
I think, is fully giving it up. Like, that's not that subtle. That's true, yeah. When he it's meets not that with subtle. the computer dude, the tech but, dude. It, but, it, like, if you if you dress it up and make it, like, kind of a joke and make it more clear in a way that David Fincher didn't, you are basically doing Pink Panther at that point, right? Right, right. exactly. You know? So they he can't do that because then that's just, like, well, isn't it funny if, like, you know, spies sucked, you know? And then right. it's like, that's not what I want to do. That's what's so interesting about it is that it's like we... As we keep making more films, the spectrum, like there's more, there's more pixels. Does that make sense? The resolution yeah, gets better. Higher is, yeah, yeah. Where it's like, we have everything in the between of these spectrums of how we, how we present stories or what mm-hmm. a twist can be or what satire mm-hmm. can be. And yeah, Fincher is very good at kind of exploring those new areas. Uh, right. Yeah. And it makes Hitchcock right. We should stop making movies. Oh yeah. We're done. True. We're done. We're, we're done. <laughs> with we are done. In an incredible ironic twist, we're out of time. Ooh, baby. <laughs> yes, indeed. Ooh, baby. Uh, Dave, and that's the game. What are your pluggables for the people who have listenables? Ah, uh, you know, you know it. Google Gamefully Unemployed, G A M E F U L L Y, Unemployed. You'll get the podcast network that I do with Tom Ryman. Uh, and, uh, and uh, yeah, we got like exclusive podcasts on our Patreon. We have a uh, we have Tom and Jeff watch Batman, which is Jeff May and Tom watching Batman. Fox Muller's a maniac, which is exactly what it sounds like, and a bunch of other things. We review movies. We we go over trailers. Um, and I guess that's it. Also, check out some more news. I'm the head writer over at Some More News. There you so go. That's there that's the other go. thing to do. That is a completely different entity. That is also what it sounds like. It's about news. You love news. Hell yeah. Thank you for joining us for this riveting conversation about the game, my friend. Thank you for (laughs) having you to Bender Bending Rodriguez for the pick. For the pick. Of course. Last order of short business. Just want to let people know that if they hop on over again to the patreon.com slash small beans feed and, you know, throw us some subscription buckaroos, uh, you get some pretty sweet early content or content that wouldn't hit the free feed. And in the next in the next month, we expect to see a lot of frame rates because this holiday uh, we got a little behind on Pick the Flex, so we're going to mm. be like blasting those out. One Upsmanship is going to have another episode very soon. You only get that if you if, if you throw us five dollars. Uh, we got shooting threes with Bridget and Sarah. We got a tales from the uh, tales from the pit with Adam Ganser, and of course, as uh, uh, we mentioned or Dave mentioned, we got uh, Star Trek: The Next Futurama coming up in a few Mondays here. So. Feel free to come on by. The water's fine. Come on in. I have something to reveal. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I am Bender Bending Rodriguez. I constructed <gasps> this whole really? podcast. Is this true? Is this a twist unfolding before me? Double twist. I'm not. I had nothing oh. to do with it. Boom. Double twist, baby. Double twist. That's not a... All right. Ah! You just fulfilled the promise of the game. Yeah. <laughs>